Now, when it comes to the actual process of replicating DNA, we call it DNA synthesis or replication. And this is a process that includes many proteins, and it's a, and a very complex process that teaches us a lot about how to efficiently build things. In fact, I wish that more construction companies would actually take a look at how wonderful their DNA inside of each of them, those workers actually is and how wonderfully life actually does this job with, and how efficiently it does it and how fast it can do it. But this is one of those things that we talked about where the chicken or the egg situation of what's more important, or DNA or proteins. As we talked before, Proteins are necessary for DNA to maintain its structural integrity because most of the chromosomes is actually made up of those histone molecules and also the protein scaffolding in the middle of the, of the, of the chromosome. And so if you think about that and then the fact that DNA copy would be impossible without the use of proteins, which we were going to be talking about soon, it just brings to light that how can you have DNA if you don't have proteins? But then proteins are based on DNA. So you wouldn't have them if you didn't have DNA. So it's a catch-22 situation. Notice, you need topoisomerase, single-strand binding proteins, helicase, polymerase, ligase, primase, telomerase, uh, nuclease, excision repair enzymes. A lot of other proteins are involved in this process. And so proteins and DNA have a very close, tied-up relationship, and we're going to learn about that in this video lecture series. So. The point of replication is to create two identical copies of the DNA polymer. And to do so, is basically unzip the molecule, and each of the strands of the old polymer serves as the template for the formation of a new strand, as you see here. How did this actually happen? Through the help of several proteins, which I just mentioned. And this will happen during the S phase of the interphase of the cell cycle, especially in the nucleus of eukaryotes. On the prokaryotes, those will happen directly in the cytoplasm. But the S phase, will, will, the nucleus will be focusing on duplicating the DNA and making those structures, or we call cytochromatids, which are connected by the centromere, although they will not be visible until tele, telophase when the chromosomes coiled up. Now, this graph is actually representing the, the somatic cells of your body, which undergo mitosis at the completion of the, of the cycle. But... In germ cells, after the G2 phase is completed, you will go into meiosis. But the point is, before any cell division, before any time you're going to split the cell apart, you're going to have to duplicate the DNA. And since cell division is necessary for growth and repair and development, this is going to be crucial for life. And so DNA synthesis is a very important part of biology. And it all starts at the Y fork. Now, the Y fork is this funny little structure that happens once the the DNA strand unzips, as you see here. And that is an actual electrical microscopic picture of what the Y fork actually looks like. If you pull back a little, though, from the Y fork, you will see that it's not actually a fork, but more like a bubble that the DNA copies itself. And I think of this by this analogy. If you want to build a road, the fastest way to build a road, instead of just basically starting the road here and then building the road forward, is to actually have the road start construction at several different points, as you see in the graph here, and then have several teams building this road all at once, and then the road gets completed once the teams meet each other. And that's kind of how it happens in your body with these replication bubbles. Each bubble is one section of DNA being copied, and as one bubble reaches the other, you're going to have a completed strand. And we'll talk about how this process actually happens uh, very soon. Another thing that I need to know before we start is the idea of nucleoside triphosphates. Now, remember we talked about the link between the ATP molecule, which is the energy molecule of the cell, and nucleic acids. We talked about how similar the ATP actually looks to, the, to a nucleotide. And in fact, if you actually look at ATP, it's basically the nucleotide uh, adenine, ribose, and a phosphate group, which you see in an RNA molecule. But... In fact, all ATP has a very, very close similarity to the DNA too, and the nucleosides of DNA come from molecules that look like ATP. These molecules are called nucleoside triphosphates, and basically, they have that basic structure of ATP, which is three phosphate groups, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Of course, the base will vary. It could be adenine, it could be thymine, it could be cytosine, or it could be guanine. But basically, this will be the structure of the nucleosides before they are added to the DNA strand. And the principle here is based on the fact that there's a lot of energy stored in those bonds between the phosphate groups. 
And if you break those bonds, you're going to release the energy, kind of like it happens with ATP in the cell. And so if you have these molecules, the nucleoside triphosphates that you see here, and they have those three phosphate groups, by removing each phosphate group, I can get energy out of this molecule. And so when the DNA unzips up in that Y fork that you see here, and you're now waiting for a new base to be added to complete the other strand, the way it works is that one of these nucleoside triphosphates will attach itself to the growing strand, and then the bonds between the extra phosphate groups will be broken, and the energy of those bonds that were broken is going to be the energy that's going to be used to power the connection of that nucleoside triphosphate, which is now a nucleoside monophosphate, or basically a nucleotide, to the growing DNA strand. So it's the energy that comes from breaking those phosphate groups of the triphosphate that you actually use to, to connect the nucleotide to the growing DNA strand. And that's kind of how it happens on both strands of the DNA molecule as they grow during the replication process. This replication process will start from what we call the point of origin, which is the point far away from the Y fork. So you see the Y fork over here, the point of origin will be over there. So in a typical replication bubble, you're going to have the Y fork over here, and, and then far from the Y fork, you have the origin of replication, and DNA will be copied in this direction. And the direction is always, always, always on a 3 to 5 direction. So notice that, therefore, the machinery that copies the DNA will have to go in this, it will read the old strand on a 3 to 5 direction and create a new strand on a 5 to 3 direction. And you see what's happening there, right? So while the new strand is being built on a 5 to 3 direction, the old strand is being read on a 3 to 5 direction, which means on the other side, you have to build backwards. You have to build from this side to that side because you have to read on a 3 to 5 direction and build on a 5 to 3 direction, the new strand. All right? That's because the machinery, the DNA polymerase, which is the molecule that actually copies the DNA and actually picks up those, those nucleoside triphosphates to attach it to the growing DNA strand, can only read the code on that direction. Just like in English, you read from left to right, you know? And so the, the nuclear DNA polymerase can only attach itself to the three end of the DNA molecule and move all the way to the five end. And that's what's going to cause a difference between what we call the leading strand and the lagging strand. You see, in the leading strand, the DNA, there's no problem, okay? You're going to attach itself to the three end, and the DNA polymerase will nucleotide by nucleotide, kind of just add the nucleotides as it goes along, and build the molecule. And the new strand is therefore built on a 5 to 3 direction. Remember, these directions have to do with the antiparallel strands, and I'm going to review that in a second. All right? For example, you have the phosphate group, the sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And remember that the sugar that's not part of the ring is sugar number 5. And then the sugar number 1 is going to be the one that's actually attached to the nitrogenous base. And the oxygen, you can see that to, to see which way it points up. This particular one will have the 5 pointing up, right? And the DNA strand is anti-parallel. Remember, we talked about that, that. While one side will have the oxygen pointing up, the other one will have the side pointing down. One side will go to, from 3 to 5. The other side will go from 5 to 3, right? So when its DNA is being copied on the leading strand, there's no problem. You're going to go from 3 to 5 just like that. So you're going to go in that direction, and you build a new strand on a 5 to 3 direction like we just talked about. So you're going to start from the origin of replication and built towards the Y fork the way it's supposed to be. But on the lagging strand, you have to build opposite or against the direction. And that basically means that you're going to go from the Y fork, actually, towards the point of origin. Okay, so you're going to review what that means in a second. All right, so in the leading strand, again, you're going to go from 3 to 5 just normally. But the lagging strand, you have to go on the opposite direction since the strands are anti-parallel. Now, there's going to be a problem which is going to force this lagging strand to be built in pieces or many short segments. And to explain this, we actually have to see um, the picture of the whole. By the way, these short pieces are called Okazaki fragments. And they must be joined by an enzyme called ligase because each of the pieces are actually separated from the other. So, uh, enzyme is going to have to build a bridge between the two of them and kind of connect the pieces. And we'll talk about what, how that works in just one second. All right? Ligase is going to be building that bridge, like I just talked about, between the two Okazaki fragments. Okay? Now, 
let's review and explain why this needs to be like that. Okay, and before we do that, we'll take it step by step from the beginning and do the actual process of copying. First and foremost, you have this one continuous DNA strand. Nothing is going to be copied here if this is going to be inside of a very coiled up chro chromosome and so, or chromatin. So the first thing that has to happen when the DNA is being copied is that it's going to be transferred from heterochromatin to eochromatin. Remember, heterochromatin is chromatin when the DNA is very coiled up it's in itself. You're going to have to uncoil that up before you can actually copy the DNA. So that's going to happen first. After that, the very first action of the actual copy process is going to be the action of an enzyme called topoisomerase, which you see as a circle in this screen. Now, what topoisomerase will do is it will uncoil the DNA molecule because remember, the DNA molecule is a coiled helix. So it will uncoil un and untwist the DNA molecule and allow the DNA molecule to be, to be copied that way. And it will remain there in the beginning of the Y fork, attach itself to the strand to stabilize the structure of the DNA molecule. Because remember, we told you on the previous video that the reason why it's coiled and, and twisted is to stabilize the molecule. So when you untwist it, you actually make the molecule kind of flimsy and more likely to break. So topoisomerase will hold the stress, kind of like a strut, while the building is being built until the actual copy process is completed because the DNA does not like to be untwisted. So it will stay there, and if it leaves, it will just twist itself back again and screw up the process. Without topoisomerase, this whole thing will be impossible. Then it comes in the sexiest enzyme on the body, helicase, because it, wait for it, unzips the genes. <laughs> you got it? That's right. Helicase, the sexiest enzyme in the body, comes up next and unzips the genes. It's the enzyme that creates the Y fork and separates the strands of the DNA. And you see that in blue as a wedge in the actual molecule. But all it's actually doing is going to be breaking those hydrogen bonds that exist between the, nu the nucleotides of each of the strands. And it's going to make the molecules unzip. Problem is the DNA does not like to stay unzipped. So if you join unzip the DNA, the, zip, the DNA goes all zip, backs up. So in order to maintain the DNA unzipped, something has to come to come in and kind of like hold the tension or just like, you know, I think of it as like a pacifying the nitrogenous base. It's like, hold on, it's going to be okay. You're not going to be unpaired for too long. I'm going to take care of you until then. And these are the single strand binding proteins that they basically stabilize the unpaired strands and make sure the DNA stays unzipped after helicase does that. And you see them as these little purple things in the screen there. Next, step four, comes in primase. Now, primase is an enzyme that pretty much marks the starting spot for the DNA copy process. It will tell DNA polymerase, this is where you start copying from, right here. So I think of it as like, you know, those cones that you put on the road to be like, hey, there's construction. It's going to start from right here. So watch out. There's construction. Slow down. Uh, this is going to happen. And uh, the construction trucks, this is where you're going to start working from. And so DNA primase is going to act like the machine that actually lays down those those cones the cones themselves are called rna primers and these are small little segments of rna uh, nucleotides that actually attach themselves to the dna double, double helix strands which are open and serve as, as the markers that then dna polymerase is going to recognize to actually start copying the, pro the copy process and it marks the starting spot of that and these primers will eventually be removed and replaced with actual dna nucleotides as polymerase attaches there and does its job. Now, the next one will be our DNA polymerase. It's basically the copy machine. It is the, uh, is the truck, the construction truck that comes through and, and actually replicates the code. Now remember that this machine can only work on a three to five direction when it's reading, which means it's going to be building the new strand on a five to three direction. It's gonna read the code in a three to five direction, but build on a five to three direction because the DNA is of course anti-parallel. 